Uh, so good afternoon. Well, my name is Chris Nordyke, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, in Summit Cleaning and Restoration, we're a facility services and disaster restoration company, um, meaning we do routine services for commercial properties, specifically uh, senior housing, uh, hotel and, and lodging properties. Um, and then we also, of course, do the emergency response build back. We're a commercial general contractor throughout the state of Oregon. Uh, my background, just uh, relevant to our talk today, is I spent eight years as a state farm agent and uh, specialized in business owners and property owners. And so some of the things I'm going to share uh, really come from kind of that background. My name is Cliff Hockley. Can you hear me? Is this, should I bring this closer to the mic? Oh, closer mic. Here we go. Let's see. Okay. Cliff Hockley, I've been uh, celebrating. This is my 30th year in uh, property management brokerage. Um, I still have a couple brown hairs up here. And um, our company was formed in 1972. Um, I am both a CCIM and a CPM. And so uh, I have a lot of experience in those regards. And we've been involved in commercial, residential, community association management, as well as brokerage. And so we're, um, we started out with 10 people. Today we have 110. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty significant organization. We do a lot of really good things for a lot of our clients. Um, been around for a long time. And our presentation today, which we're excited to share with, is going to be about due diligence. And so um, both of us have spent quite a bit of time preparing today. The slides should be, are you running the slides? Uh, there you go. Yes, I will. All right, Chris is running the slides. So that we got the easy stuff going here. And um, I think I might just stand. See if that works. All right. Does this work? All right, beautiful. So um, as you know, uh, we all hire inspectors to do projects for us. And as we get through the inspection process and the deal closes, and then we find out what the inspectors didn't catch, what they didn't see, what they didn't know, what we didn't know to ask. And so today our objective is to sort of help you. Most of you have been through some of these, but maybe one or two ideas will come up as we talk that will be helpful as you prepare and plan due diligence for projects you're working on. Clearly, um, money spent on due diligence will pay off. Um, and there are a lot of clients that don't really want to spend money on due diligence, and they just want to walk through a building, and they say, oh, yeah, I know enough, and, I'm, yeah, and then all of a sudden they end up with a, a, a brownfield. So... Uh, all right. All right. So uh, the other part of this is that a lawsuit can kill your business. So being a little bit proactive about due diligence is a positive thing and uh, gives you an opportunity to uh, not be a deal killer, but I believe be a deal maker as a broker. Um, so how many of you have uh, found problems after you've closed a deal? Didn't inspect a property properly. Excuse me, a property properly, and your client calls up and says, "You know, Cliff, John, Darcy, I found this after I closed." And then you're waiting for the for the letter to come in the mail that says lawsuit. Anybody have any of those experiences? Anybody ever? No? What a shy crowd! Oh, one. Okay, good. That's you're brave, Ian. So. Um, your client definitely needs to be prepared to invest. And we're in the next slide. And it starts with a really basic paperwork. So most of us are, at least I'm very systematized about the way I do a, a, a deal. I want to look at the leases, the rent rolls, the P&Ls, and the tax returns. So what do most clients do? They don't report half of anything, or they over-report, or they imagine expenses on their tax returns. So the tax returns are maybe a good place to start, but definitely not a place to finish. Um, I can't tell you how many rent rolls for commercial and apartments I've reviewed that aren't accurate. Just because there's a management company, it's helpful. Usually the quality is a little bit better. Um, but if an owner's doing their own books, wow, that's very dangerous territory. I had a deal years ago I put together. It was a 20 unit apartment building and the owner uh, decided to ignore the deposits that he had and uh, then this tenant started moving out a year later, and sure enough, um, we found out that he had forged all of the rental agreements, okay? Forged all the rental agreements and taken all the security deposits off the rental agreements. So 
you know, it cost us seven, eight thousand dollars. It wasn't going to destroy the client, but it's one of those one of those little things. So I'm pretty cynical when it comes to due diligence. I really look very closely at the paperwork. I'm extremely organized, three ring binder, review all the leases, match the leases to the rent roll, make sure they're the same. And I would say five times out of 10, they're not the same. So it's, and usually it's communication issues. Usually a new tenant's moved in, usually something hasn't caught up paperwork wise. It's usually not a major deal. But reconciling rental agreements, usually you'll discover some mistakes. Next. So, uh, you also want to look at the copy of the current tax assessments, the three-year history, service contracts, landscape agreements, janitorial agreements, special agreements like garbage, alarm monitoring, and most important, bing, long-term contracts like laundry room contracts. So how many of you have seen those 10-year laundry room contracts? Anybody? Yeah. And so um, the good news is X company that does a lot of those 10-year contracts has decided to uh, abridge those in most cases and will be flexible. But it's pretty hard to close when you see on a title report, and I just closed a transaction a month ago, where you have two laundry contracts and they haven't been wiped off of the contract, off the preliminary title report. Not only that, they're automatically renewing. And the one service provider is out of business. And nothing's been wiped out. So you really need to be checking prelim. Um, Next item on the agenda is taxes paid. Of course, are the taxes paid? Usually they're paid at escrow at closing. Easements and plat maps. So easements are always an issue. Um, we have found a lot of unrecorded e easements. We've found easements that are problematic to make properties work. And I personally bought a property that had no roads and no access at all. And so you need to know what you're buying. So you're going to say, why would you buy a property? that has no access. Well, we assembled the developer and we bought the property around it that had access, put in a couple roads and for $15,000 I bought myself a home site. Pretty cool, huh? That's all doable when you do due diligence. Um, so here's the tricky stuff, legal descriptions, okay? Last year one of the brokers in our office tried to close a deal and, or actually closed the deal, but as they were working through the deal they found out that the listing broker had split off the parking lot from the, there were two separate lots, had split off the parking lot and decided to sell it separately from the apartment itself and not disclose that to the um, selling broker. And so there you are, you're trying to put together a deal and for whatever reason, and this is absolutely critically important, you really need to read the prelim and you need to look at the map and you need to figure out, am I really buying what I think I'm buying? And you're going to say, well, that's the, seller's the buyer's responsibility. So how many of you think that's the buyer's responsibility? How many of you think it's their attorney's responsibility? Ah, well, the attorney isn't usually in on the deal because, what, they're deal killers and we don't want to mess with them, right? So, um, so they don't get a chance to check that. And the attorneys are very thorough and thoughtful about these issues. So the clients, guess what? They're just not smart enough. They're just not sophisticated. You know, unless you've got somebody you're doing a deal with every six months or a year, most buyers are just not that sophisticated. So they will look to you and say, well, you're the expert, hmm. and not only that, you're the CCIM, and you should know, okay? So in that particular case, I believe we settled and we got them to add the lot back in and <clears throat> ended up closing the deal. But it, you ha <clears throat> it came up because we were thorough in the due diligence, and otherwise it wouldn't have come up. Another situation was a hotel in Eugene. We closed. Um, uh, our managing broker, Mike Gagos, had to actually step in and babysit this deal to the end. Um, the, the legal description was not accurate, and about this much of the neighbor's property was being sold along with the hotel. And we couldn't make that hotel work without that piece of property, and he wanted a million dollars. No joke. It took six months for us to work through it. And again, what happened is on the PSA, the lots weren't laid out carefully enough and the, there wasn't a survey completed. And whenever there's land that's of a significant size, I encourage surveys. Next, we also have instances, of course, of adverse possession, which is what happened in this hotel case. Um, 
trying to find the trail of ownership if they're actually able to close, um, what are the encumbrances, and um, who the authorized signatures are, signatories are. Because uh, as, we, as the baby boomers are aging out, some of them are dying, and then it's their kids and their grandkids and their cousins and all these people that you think you're dealing with the right person, but you may not be. And sometimes the listing broker doesn't even know who the right people that need to sign off on, on a deal are. So with that, I'm transitioning. Chris, you want to stand up? Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to focus on one of the comments that Cliff just made, which is you should know, right? Because obviously when you have a professional designation, you have licensing, certification, um, people grow to expect you to know everything. Um, so what I'm hoping to do over the next several slides is, with regard to hazardous materials and certain time, uh, types of inspections is to kind of load your lips, as one of my mentors told me, um, for those next difficult conversations with buyers. So. Cliff and I got into this great conversation about what, what you guys want to know, and the reality is it depends on what side of the deal you're on, whether this stuff matters and how it matters in a transaction, right? And a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be sharing, it, it's really relevant to those of you that are representing buyers, so you can help them think of all the potential uh, consequences of the property that they're buying. So. We're going to, I'm going to go deeper on some of these, uh, particularly mold. All of us deal with mold. It really doesn't matter what class of uh, real estate that you're specializing in. Uh, mold is something that uh, we run into a lot. Um, this was uh, a fairly large multifamily complex uh, job we did recently. And you look at this and it's like, wow, okay, this is a pretty dirty turn. It's kind of an ugly bathroom. Um, but would not necessarily be alarming until you get up closer and you start to see what looks like mold. And if you don't know any better, um, somebody could say, oh, it's just mildew, just paint over it. Just bleach clean it and paint over it. Unfortunately, uh, and sometimes that is true. Unfortunately, though, there was a much bigger problem at play here that would be really helpful for a buyer to know uh, before they get on a property, right? Um, what actually happened in this property is that it had radiant ceiling heat throughout this whole property, which is a really terrible combination uh, in, in the Northwest. Also poor ventilation, right, in the bathroom uh, and, and the rest of the place. So what we ultimately ended up having to do was to tear out a lot of drywall, encapsulate the attic space was above, this is a top floor unit. And essentially what was happening, the potential risk to the buyer is, um, that poor ventilation was essentially circulating microbial spores all throughout this living space for, for we don't know how long. We abated the problem, we cleaned it up, and, but it's the difference between you know, uh, an inspector saying, hey, you've got some mildew, uh, just go ahead and bleach it, cover it up, four or $500 fix, and what really is you know, a three, four, five thousand dollar $5,000 fix to abate it appropriately um, to mitigate risk. Super, super common especially those of you that really focus on multifamily. It's right. And again, and again, the whole goal is th there are probably inspectors and other people party to the sale that would just say, hey, no big deal. And so this is really for you as the buyers to just at least help them dig into it enough to where they can feel like they're fully informed before the transaction happens. Uh, what are the most common mold sites? Uh, and, and it's interesting, inspectors routinely miss this stuff. We get pulled in shortly after a sale all the time for these kind of water, moisture issues, microbial growth, et cetera, and it was missed in the transaction. Because you gotta look for this stuff, but it, it gets missed. Refrigerators, um, it doesn't matter what kind of property, um, but refrigerators are a major, major site because of all the, the condensation, uh, the warmth that happens behind that refrigerator. Um, there's very, typically, uh, Architects don't account for enough space, buffer space, behind the refrigerator in the back wall, and that's, that's a major component in why microbial growth gets started in there. The biggest is in this area. Okay, so the two biggest losses that we have are um, dishwasher lines, and that's improved over the years. If you've got a brand new or a, a recently new property, the, the hoses that they use are much less susceptible to breakage and leakage, but it is still the number one water loss in multifamily and single family residents that we see is 
a leaky or a burst dishwasher uh, line under that, that sink there. And it's, it's really difficult to spot until the floor starts to buckle. Um, and a lot of times, again, this is something that inspectors overlook. It just doesn't get looked at. Attic, um, mechanical openings, crawl spaces, um, depending on what type of structure we're, we're talking about, uh, super, super common. I, I just can't tell you enough, we come in behind general contractors uh, to either start routine services or do post-construction cleanup and things of that sort. I can't tell you how often these details, like ventilation, and uh, that are missed by the contractor and by inspectors and throughout the, the uh, purchase transaction, but poor ventilation is the leading cause of microbial growth in, uh, in attics. And it's a really big problem because you've got uh, mechanical, you've got uh, ventilation going through that area, microbial spores that are going everywhere. There's a lot of risk exposure. Okay, so uh, how many of you have uh, been party to a sale with uh, an EFIS exterior building? Okay, so you've been involved. Uh, um, super common, um, less so uh, in new development, obviously, uh, in the Northwest. What we found is they're really, really great in the South, Southwest, the, the drier climates. They're an awesome uh, method for an uh, awesome building system. In the Northwest, they've just been rife with um, moisture issues in the exterior envelope, um, rife with mold issues. This is an example of a customer we have in Portland. Uh, it's a nine-story hotel space developed in 1995. It was a pretty innovative structure, actually, when it was put up um, with the uh, concrete structure with the EFIS exterior. And unfortunately, over the last 10 plus years, in a space like this, they've replaced the wall in a number of units, eight, sometimes nine times. Um, the exterior walls, um, the uh, interior finishes, and, and the reason is, is that water comes through with the, the south exposure particularly. Water uh, penetrates the exterior envelope and it just seeps down into the styrofoam uh, within the wall and also hits any of the uh, attachment points, the steel attachment points to the structure and it just seeps. The water just runs through there. Uh, it's a major problem, but here's the interesting thing. It's, it's often not gonna show up in inspections because unless there's some sort of water intrusion episode, so if this transaction is taking place in the summer, there's nothing going on, there is no way to find out about those water intrusion uh, episodes unless they disclose it or you do an intrusion test, which is what we did with a client here recently, uh, where you actually get, in, in some cases, it can be as rudimentary as just a power washer applied to the exterior of the building face and watching and moisture metering and using some of the tools I'll talk about here to identify that there's an intrusion issue. Um, otherwise, you get into the wall and you have to inspect for mold. Uh, but those are the only ways. So it can often get overlooked in the inspection process. It can be very costly, as you might imagine, tearing out walls in a nine-story hotel. So, so what do you do? All right, so if you're a buyer, you want to uh, inform your buyer in a situation like this. You can bring in a specialty contractor, inspector, a third party like Summit to go inspect that place and do some moisture metering. The reality is though, um, if it's a, a situation like I just talked about in the summertime and there's no water episodes taking place, uh, we just actually need to um, check the walls. So if there's been a past issue and we wanna check and see if there's a re recurring issue, it would require opening up some walls, which uh, is probably not gonna happen in the middle of the transaction. Let's talk about asbestos. So how many of you have had asbestos come up in a transaction, a property you own or have been involved with? Okay. So back in 2005, uh, myself and a few partners owned a uh, service business uh, in the whole part of the craze in the early, early 2000s, refilling and remanufacturing ink cartridges and laser toners. And part of our operation was a retail space. And uh, we signed our lease. We get in to go do our tenant improvements, and um, we had papered up the front window, but not the door. Somebody looked in and saw that we had what, what they thought were 12 by 12 asbestos tiles, and uh, they stopped in and told us, and it, long story short, not really knowing any better exactly what was involved, this is 10 plus years ago, uh, 
our contractor, who is a friend of the family, uh, just started pulling up those tiles. Well, again, somebody walks by the open door, it's summer, and they uh, turn us in to the city inspector, and all of a sudden it turns into kind of a thing. Um, anybody had a thing come out of asbestos? Okay, so in my due diligence, I actually, in my web searching, I actually found a case where DEQ issued some fines to people uh, in affiliated with CCIM. So somewhere out there, there's somebody who's gonna say, ah, that's me. Um, it, it is really common, asbestos, uh, a lot of the, the fines that you see levied uh, for asbestos by the DEQ, many of them are less than uh, 500 square feet of tiles. It's really common, you get into a transaction, trying to close a deal, asbestos comes up, no problem, I've got this guy, we do it at night, we double bag it in black, you know, and unfortunately though, is it doesn't always work out. You think, oh, there's no harm in it, nobody's gonna get hurt, and in most cases, it's not. Yeah. 246 square feet takes it to a moderate violation, be a $12,000 fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the case example that I saw was roughly 250 square feet of non-friable, so meaning it's not actually emitting dust and stuff into the air, it's just encapsulated, it's an asbestos-containing material. Uh, 250 square feet, not abated appropriately by licensed people, uh, amounted to roughly $25,000 in fines for the two parties involved. That's a really terrible way to end a deal. But it happens, it's, it's not uncommon. There's tons and tons of transactions. And it's just one of those things where, hey, I think I can help my customer avoid some of these extra costs. So in, instead of paying a couple thousand dollars to abate that, uh, it ends up potentially um, costing a lot. There is asbestos everywhere in a lot of commercial buildings. It's used less and less, of course, but it only takes 1% of asbestos content for that to be an asbestos-containing material. Uh, and, and so it's important to be aware of that and to make your customer aware of that. This is a great little graphic here. If you guys want this afterwards, uh, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, but probably the most common is the flooring uh, because asbestos is not only in the tile material, it's in the mastic. And, um, and, and so the, mo the majority of fines you see is people ripping up asbestos tile, okay? So be aware of that. It's even on the adhesive material on the mirrors, the really common in multifamily, those inexpensive mirror backings. Radon, um, any of you had a radon inspection with a property transaction? Okay. You know, Cliff was mentioning me that it's not common uh, at all. Very few banks, if any, are, are requiring it um, as a part of the, what's interesting though, is radon is actually fairly common in the Portland area. Um, and I thought this graphic was really interesting. This is from, um, this is a DEQ graphic, just showing actual reported test results. So when there has been a test, a voluntary test by a property owner or some sort of regulatory test occurrence, uh, the red is the highest um, rates of uh, radon. So you can see those pockets right there. And you know, radon uh, can be costly depending on the size of the property, but it's very simple. I mean, basically radon is contained in the ground. And so there's what they call subterranean suction venting system that's installed. Um, sometimes it's as little as a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks, you know, for a small sixplex or it, it isn't necessarily a super costly event in the transaction. Fun fact, uh, radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer. If you know that, behind smoking according to CDC. Okay, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Cliff respond here about lead-based paint, you got a well, fun I'm just, story. I'm just, a little fun story. We were involved in doing a transaction down in Salem. Went out there, needed to make sure there wasn't any lead-based paint. You're all familiar with the little sticks, right? Take out the stick, break it, rub it on the wall. No color, no lead-based paint. Wrong. What I, you need to do is you need to scrape off the cover paint in order to get the lower paint which, of course, was lead-based paint and almost screwed up our financing for us. Um, so, yeah, I think hiring an expert on establishing lead-based paint is, uh, is important. And, and the cities have gotten very, very sticky, um, especially in older buildings. I'm in the process of putting new windows in a little fourplex that I own. And uh, the contractor said, oh, I have to do lead-based paint. Oh, yeah, it's got lead-based paint. Now I've got to do, it cost me an extra 1800 bucks on a four, four units to make sure they did the special, you know, gowns and the air and the collection and all the stuff that needs to be covered uh, for that. So lead-based paint uh, is not to be f 
ignored on buildings older than 1978. Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, actually, Cliff, it's back to I'm you. Next. You want to take the So most of you know we typically do a level one, level two, and then if there's, we find something, there's remediation, that's sort of standard. Um, I actually had a client do something really interesting this week. They hired, they had a level, their bank accepted an old level one, a clean level one. And what their bank did is they looked at the old level one, they hired for 500 bucks an environmental engineer, and he said, yeah, everything's cool, this is still current, and updated the report for 500 bucks. That was, a, that was a new one on me, but every day is a learning day in real estate, right? So um, that was pretty impressive for that client. Uh, I did not bring my reading glasses, so I'm going to do this little funky thing here. Uh, obviously, you need to have clear inspection criteria for inspection due diligence. Um, some people skip stuff. I'm pretty, again, systematic about going unit by unit in apartments or space by space in commercial buildings. Um, just making sure things don't get lost. Um, you know, uh, clear inspection criteria. We uh, helped buy a property about uh, 10 years ago and uh, we hired a property inspector and we said, yes, do your normal full scale inspection. And he gave us a quote and, um, but he didn't include dishwasher inspections in it. We didn't know that until afterwards. He said, well, there's nothing wrong with those dishwashers. They look great. They got dishes in them. Well, they did have dishes in them for storage. None of them worked. 53 apartment units. Not a single dishwasher worked. So, so was that our fault for not specking properly? Yeah, I guess so. So could the inspector have told us he wasn't going to be doing that? Yeah, it would have been helpful. Um, so again, these little small little crazy details are, are important as you, as you do your inspection due diligence. It's helpful to have as-built mechanical, electrical drawings. Um, and uh, th then the other issue is code. You know, are most of our buildings to current code? And I'm going to say, right, most of them are not to current code. So what kind of liability is that for us as brokers? It's hard to establish if there's liability. But if you have um, older breakers, or not breakers, but older fuse systems that may have, maybe have aluminum wiring, well, as an experienced broker, you know that's a red light and you need to warn your client that you know, probably need to budget in for new electrical wiring or a new box at minimum. So it's, part of this is experience, but you've got to be paying attention. And so I tend to go on in property inspections with my clients because I don't want to get, um, I, I want to make sure I understand the detail of what's happening and I can help them make the right kinds of judgments. So let's go to the next slide, which we already have. Um, we did have a transaction in Salem where the question was, was a roof inspected properly? And uh, so the client went on the roof and jumped up and down, and the inspector jumped up and down, and, and, er, and we, uh, so we signed off on the roof. And uh, it was a, um, you know, one of those uh, white, new, the whole new standard now. And uh, come to find out that um, we had a little bit of leakage all of a sudden. It rolled the roof back. The roof was in great condition. And um, it hadn't been vented properly. And so this was, you know, 20 units of a 40-unit apartment complex. And the whole roof truss system was nothing but toothpicks. Literally, it had totally condensated because there was no venting between the apartments on top and the roof system. And it would just created this humidity area. And the only reason he was able to jump up and down is because the roof itself was very strong. The roof material was very strong. But the trusses were shot. We ha when we went to look at it, we ended up ripping the whole roof off, completely rebuilding the trusses, and then insulating, because that's now the new common code. So those of you that are putting new roofs on apartments need to be thinking about, all right, is there going to be enough venting? And if you're buying a property, is there enough venting? That's not going to be th you can use that same roof system on an industrial building. It's no problem. It doesn't have anywhere near that kind of issue. Um, so let's uh, go to the next. Yeah, no, backwards one. There we go. Let's go. I mean, if you do an inspection, so why would you do an inspection? Okay. Do you think you'll find this? I mean, this is, a, this is in fact happens. A lot of property managers don't go on roofs. True story. Not my people, of course, but, um, but not a lot of property managers don't go on roofs and owners definitely don't go on roofs and they don't think it's important to number one, make sure the HVAC units are serviced and the roofs are serviced. And it's, you know, buildings collapse from the top on down. 
And so those are the critical pieces of the puzzle that we stress uh, in our business. Um, so clearly, somebody wasn't paying attention. Next. It needs preventive maintenance. This is another piece of preventive maintenance that wasn't done. It should look like this, right? So roof flashings. Um, they need to be done right. And a lot of people take shortcuts. Uh, what we ask our uh, vendors to do nowadays, because cell phones are so commonplace, we want a picture of before and after. So we know exactly what it looks like before and after. And then all of a sudden, you don't have to climb on the roof anymore. And it saves everybody a lot of time and energy. Now, back to Chris. Mm -hmm. He's talking about, talking about fire. You can imagine a tenant being pretty upset about losing all their cans of Stella. Um, this is actually pulled from a real online newspaper in Great Britain. Uh, this was not a spoof article or just a funny meme that was uh, trolling around the internet. It was actually from, I think, the London Times. Um, a garage fire, the thing he was most worried about was the beer. Um, so we're going to talk about fire risk. And again, um, generally speaking, if you're representing the seller, uh, you're, you're primarily concerned with what's discovered uh, and uncovered in the inspection. As a buyer, though, you want to know everything else as well. Uh, and so we're going to talk about some of those things to watch out for and maybe point out to your clients. Okay, so poorly installed electrical is uh, a major source of fires that we see, um, particularly in multifamily. And, and I have a hypothesis about this based on the files I've looked at of projects we've done. Um, when you've got fourplexes up to even small complexes, 20plex, you've got owner, the owner is operating to some degree and maybe has, uh, you know, somebody living on site, but the owner likes to do a lot of their own work. Some of you have maybe transacted a prop like this, bought it from somebody who long held family uh, property, where the owner has done a lot of their own electrical, or they've permitted their non-licensed staff to do electrical repairs and installations. Happens. I mean, it, it's a big problem, and um, and you really have to do a thorough electrical inspection to identify when somebody's put the live ground to the ground wire on the receptacle. Right, it's very common to see that. And, and a lot of times, tenants, they won't complain about it. They'll just have an outlet in their apartment that doesn't work. And then when they finally decide to plug it in, uh, that outlet arcs, and we've got a fire. Cadet heaters. OK, cadets are everywhere, right? Uh, back in the year 2000, there was a recall of just over 2 million units of cadet heaters. Several years uh, of product were involved in that. What's interesting, by the best data that I can find, only roughly a quarter million were actually replaced by the company during that time frame, or since, since that initial recall claim. So what does that mean? Uh, there are still a lot of faulty cadet heaters out there. And I remember reading the thing from the Consumer Protective uh, Protection Agency uh, when they announced the recall, and they said that molten spewing matter can actually come out of these uh, cadet heaters. And it was something to do with the heating element, um, having plastic components too close to the, uh, to the um, inside of it. The other thing about cadet heaters, it doesn't matter if they're a faulty heater, they have to be cleaned. So cadet says they need to be cleaned every six months. How many of your property owners and managers do that? None, right? And so that, that dust builds up on the inside and those moving parts near the heated element and it's a huge fire risk. And it's the second most common fire that we see in multifamily properties, um, not coincidentally. And also people just uh, obviously placing things in front of the cadet heaters that are on. Bark fires. Okay, so this has become a thing, and I don't know if it's because smoking now is pretty restricted as to where you can smoke, you know, in, in a lot of public areas. Uh, there's fewer and fewer properties where people could smoke indoors anywhere, uh, and so people are going outside, outside their building, and they're dropping cigarettes. It, it's actually, there's 72,000 outdoor fires right outside of a structure that are ignited in bark, and other types of um, flammable material. So there's, there's actually a trend going of people installing rock instead of bark, and there's uh, rubber bark, and there's other fire-resistant uh, stuff. Um, 
uh, brick chips that are recycled that can be put down that are fire safe. Uh, but it's super, super common. This was actually a Shiloh Inn over in Beaverton just last year. Anybody hear about that story or, okay. Um, it was a cigarette. It was a cigarette and uh, there, nobody, nobody got hurt, but it was during the day and it was a massive, massive fire where people had to be evacuated from the building. Grease fires. Okay, so if you're helping a buyer buy a restaurant or some kind of uh, like senior living facility that has commercial grills, um, they're required to have uh, commercially vented grease hoods. Um, this is really problematic and, and there's been quite a number of grease fires in restaurants. It's very common in fast food uh, because of the volume of, of what they're doing and the margins that they operate on. Um, just recently, down in Albany, there was a Burger King. It was only six or seven years old. But here's the problem, and, and this can be inspected prior to sale because there's a significant cost in retrofitting and stuff. But one of the big problems with kitchen hoods is the installers and the contractors that put them in are not necessarily thinking about uh, routine cleaning and maintenance of these hoods. They're simply looking at function and the cost to install. And so what we've seen in, on an increasing basis, especially with retrofitted, like uh, restaurants, it's a, it's a change of use in, in a space and they're adding kitchen equipment into it, is that you're seeing a lot of horizontal runs in the ducting, which is very, very difficult to clean that grease out. Uh, and so you get grease buildup in a certain segment of that ducting, it's really bad, a huge fire risk, uh, super, super common. Um, major risk if you've got a hotel with a restaurant. Uh, component to it. And, and when you go through the inspection, it doesn't always look like this. That, that's, that's the point I want to leave you with on ducks is it can look awesome. The exterior, easy to clean. But it's that space, those six or eight feet of space that might be in those horizontal runs that are really, really problematic. And, and you can inspect that with a camera. I mean, an inspector, can, you can ask for that in your inspection report. Same thing in multifamily. Right, um, some multifamily kitchens, uh, the, the vent above the range is, is vented, in, in, depending on the, the type of property you have. It's either vented to the exterior wall or, or maybe it's a, um, it's a simple fourplex that's vented into the attic space. If it's vented, that venting needs to be checked to make sure it's properly vented uh, because there's all kinds of opportunity for not only greasy particles to vent up in the attic and create a massive fire risk if there's ever a spark or an incident on the range, uh, but also microbial growth. Going back to the mold, uh, improper venting of that, that uh, range hood is super, super high liability. Also a really common multifamily fire that we see. And this is just a little tip. This is just a 50 bucks a pair for these fire suppressors. They become really popular, magnetic. They just uh, clamp on to the underside of the, the just standard multifamily range hood. Um, and it's heat sensitive. So it literally just drops open. It's got powder inside this flame retardant. The nice thing about this is, sure, you can have a fire extinguisher on the premises, but what happens a lot, we've seen this in actual fires, people will panic, get out that fire extinguisher, they'll spray it at the top of the range and knock the pot full of greasy or hot oil off onto the floor. Now all of a sudden the fire's expanded to the laminate or vinyl flooring, and now the flooring is catching on fire. So it's actually, this kind of solution is really great. It's only 50 bucks. Um, evidence of poor fire remediation. Hopefully this is really obvious. You know, as you're transacting uh, sale, this is gonna kind of jump out like a sore thumb. Um, but it is amazing how people will just paint over things like this. And so, you know, uh, finding a non-visible place to just fit your thumb a little bit and see what's going on under that, especially check the texture of the painted surfaces, like attic, um, closet space, et cetera, is a good way to just kind of check for that. Okay, Cliff. Thank you. He's obviously taller than I am. Um, so you want to be checking, as we talked about a little earlier, HVAC, elevator, pest and dry rot. Uh, often I've seen uh, commercial inspections hire a structural inspector, but they don't really like getting on their hands and knees and going to crawl spaces. And so you miss that whole pest and dry rot piece of the puzzle sometimes. Parking, is there enough? There's a building across the street from us. You know, we're, when we talk about due diligence, you know, 
we're talking about not just about the ability of, for a building to stand, but also for a building to generate revenue. And so when you have a building, and, so, and as we know, important, right, we're building apartments without parking, among other things. But commercial buildings without parking are really tricky if they're not downtown or they're not close to a parking structure. So we have a building that's located across the street from our building, actually, on Barber Boulevard, that's been pretty empty for years, 20 years, because they only, it's a 15,000 square foot building with, uh, what is it, 15 parking spaces, one space per thousand. So you got to be going, okay, is this going to work? Yeah, I'm on a bus line, but how does this really play? Um, for medical, you need five per thousand. For most commercial uses, you need at least four per thousand. You start getting a three or two per thousand range, <clears throat> you've got a parking problem. And if you don't pay attention to your mix, a good example on Barber was a, a building that had a school in it. And those students used up so much parking that they couldn't tenant the rest of the building. Um, and so that created a deficiency in the value of the building, and they, and they really struggled to make that building work. Um, elevators, have they been serviced or tested? And do they meet current codes? Codes change all the time. Don't just assume because it's sitting there as an elevator, it's working properly and has been recently inspected. The next um, slide is about sewer lines. You know, this is all very detailed, unfortunately, but um, gravity flow, pumped. Is there a pump station? How old is the pump station? Is this pump station going to blow up in the middle of the night? Is it alarmed? Um, and uh, wait, go back one more. It was too fast. Uh, root damage, underground injection control systems, which are dry wells. As you know, basically DEQ has been um, assigned to inspect these, um, these storm drains, and um, they don't have the money or resource to do that. And so we're doing a lot of transactions in the marketplace and leaving old systems in place that are probably illegal, and some banks have chosen not to finance deals unless we have the new filter systems put in place. So you want to understand what your bank is going to require um, for dry wells. Uh, sprinkler systems, are they freeze protected, dry or wet? And then uh, on sewer lines, you really need to scope them. People that, you know, especially with older buildings, you've got to scope them. You could have a tile sewer system, you know, 50, 60 years ago they used, um, what's that material? Tile, terracotta tile, thank you, terracotta tile, and they slid them together. And the roots, they just make mincemeat out of the tile. We closed a deal, sold it to an attorney. He turned around and sued us because the, we didn't scope the line and we should have known. Um, and then Chris is going to talk a little bit about moisture meters and heat thermal imaging and ozone abatement before we, we tie up. We're right close to being done here. Should I demonstrate? Yeah, you totally can, sure. Uh, go ahead and ye yell one first. Um, so Cliff is holding actually a, a, a newest generation of moisture meter device that we just upgraded all of our text to. Um, it, essentially, it has an invasive, and there's a, some points under that cap on the top. You can pull that top off. We're actually penetrating surfaces. That's, that's nothing new. It also combines... Uh, non-invasive measures for tracking against walls. Um, the thing about all of this equipment is it depends on what side of the deal you're on, whether you want to pull it out, right? It can be a, a deal maker, a relationship maker, right, by pointing this stuff out for your buyer, uh, but you bring this in uh, in a seller scenario and uh, it complicates things, right? And the thing about uh, moisture monitoring equipment and inspection equipment is it's not a perfect science. Our techs have a lot of training to recognize patterns and trends. So this, this FLIR device is actually a thermal imaging device that allows us to see what's, what, what are happening with the different um, temperature differentials in a certain area. Um, if, but, to the, but really, there, there's, there's nothing factual or scientific about the results of this. So it can potentially raise some question marks because there might be some moisture there, but there also could be a draft because of the, the most recent window installation, right? So um, be careful how you bring these in the transaction. They can be really helpful uh, for the buyer to try to discover some of these issues ahead of time so they can be aware of them. Um, but certainly you can bring a third party to do these inspections if you're on the buyer side and you'd like more detailed information, we can come in and, and do moisture mapping. But again, it doesn't mean anything unless there's a water event, right? So in the summer, 
uh, this is something you just need to be aware of as a risk, is identifying previous water damage or water intrusion points in, in a property is really difficult. Um, so sometimes testing and doing a water intrusion test can be really, really helpful, um, especially if you've got a tight deal and, or a really uh, risk-averse you know, customer. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is just the ozone. How many of you have used ozone in a property? You know, we actually get quite a few calls from both commercial and residential realtors to come in mid-transaction because they've got a buyer that smelled something uh, in their property and they, or it gave them a headache or they weren't sure what it is. And sometimes cleaning agents are off gas, so their cleaning company came in and finished and that's what the customer is smelling. Um, but, but you've all experienced that where you've got a really finicky buyer and odor abatement can be just that little piece that keeps the deal flowing. Uh, it's a really inexpensive thing. Uh, if you run into it a lot, I mean, they're, you know, four or 500 bucks for a unit, or you can just bring us in and we'll put several on site and a beta space over a period of 24 hours. It'd be really, really effective for also eliminating uh, smoker smell and other stuff that can slow down a multifamily deal. Um, that's it, do we just kind of... So obviously it's evident that uh, due diligence will result a good due diligence will result in a good result, and no due diligence will become a disaster and a, a lawsuit waiting to happen. We actually have a summary of our notes on the back table uh, with a little due diligence checklist, if that's helpful, and then we'll go to questions and answers. So are there any questions? And should we um, hand out a little mic, maybe? I think I can talk. You can talk? Cliff. All right. So Cliff, do you have a checklist that you give to your vendors that you have an expectation that you have to go through a process so that you have Well, we have a due diligence checklist that we use, and then we then we create for each separate vendor. They have to they they get told, all right, you're doing this HVAC, you're doing this elevator test, you're doing this structural, you're doing the roof. I mean, um, the real doing it right is expensive, and so you really have to want to buy that property, and so you have to really go through in my mind two steps steps is, you know, the the paperwork, and then sort of a preliminary <coughs> assessment, and then. As things get more complicated, then you have to say, all right, well, here's a problem I need to get more information on. But, uh, you know, HVAC units in commercial buildings, I think, are a huge cost structure problem issue. And it's an example of we really need to spend some time and money, and a lot of people don't. Next question. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I haven't run across that yet, but I have run across some people to do limited. We have a deal going on right now which is limited where they're, they're assume, making a lot of assumptions. Um, we, I have not had them sign a waiver uh, because, you know, I have to say Keller Williams covers itself from the top to bottom with waiver, 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 waiver. I mean, I'm involved with a, on a transaction with a Keller Williams agent, and I mean, the stack of papers like this. Um, we'd be smart, actually, be better, better prepared. Keller Williams has obviously had enough, has enough people in the field. They've run into enough issues, so I think they're better prepared. In the end, though, that paper will not protect you. It's really insurance has to protect you. So I would encourage everybody to have errors and emissions insurance. Um, I think that's really the more important lesson is, yes, you need to be thorough about your due diligence and have a checklist and be experienced and learn. But at the same time, nothing's going to prevent you from a client that doesn't want to take responsibility for their own actions. And so I would encourage you to carry errors and emissions insurance to manage your liability um, because, you know, as good as you are, it, it, there's, no man, there's no perfect to what we do. So, uh, but if you want to share some of those forms, I'm sure. I'm curious. I, I know you go through a lot of business here, so. We do, but we don't have that built in. I mean, we, we don't really waver off that much stuff. I think, I think you make a really good point, and I think that we're going to go back to the table and come up with uh, some sort of process where these are the inspections we recommend. If you choose not to do them, it's on your own uh, recognizance. You know, it's your own decision making. I think it's an excellent, excellent idea, and I would encourage all of you to think that through. Any other questions? Yes. Well, so the short answer is it depends. Um, ozone is actually a really effective um, antibacterial, antimicrobial process, um, but it's not a cure-all. Um, th the way we see it, the, the customer, the seller can obviously, or the buyer, can opt to have an industrial hygienist you know, survey the site if they're concerned about a smell that they're getting. Um, but if there's nothing in the disclosures and, uh, and they're not interested in that more expensive due diligence, this can be a way just to maybe remove that as a speed bump. 
and clean the air in the process. It is effective. So how long does it last? Is well, the question is part of the question. Yeah, how long does it last? Well, it um, depending on where what the source of the odor, it, it eliminates it. It's it's gone in a lot of cases. It's permanent. Um, so does this eliminate meth odor as well? No, uh, no, but it, <laughs> no, not necessarily. It is part of the process, though. Oftentimes in meth house abatement, though. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. For Chris, yeah. It just. Yeah, it just totally depends on the situation. If you've got a water source, so a lot of times uh, people don't realize that you can have perforations in your water lines in the walls, and depending on the structure of the building, you know, you have certain water lines that run up through the ceiling structure. It's really odd what we used to do in some of our building processes. But a perforated water line, uh, it is almost undetectable until it's a major problem, and it's creating microbial issues that are causing headaches. It's also interfering potentially with the ventilation and the HVAC system in the house if that's running through the wall systems and underneath the house. Yeah, it's a big problem. Uh, so I'm, I'm not an expert on the, on the insurance side with EFIS, um, but what we've seen with customers is that, yeah, there is no, uh, there seems to be no coverage in the situations we've encountered. Uh, and there isn't an easy fix. You can imagine a lot of, a lot of the properties that use DFIS uh, are, are multi-level, you know, typically six, seven, eight, 10, 15, 25 stories. It's very, very difficult to do any wide-scale abatement or um, uh, renovation to EFIS exterior, and we're talking millions of dollars and uh, safety costs and, and construction costs for that. So oftentimes they're just stuck repairing the same sites over and over and over again. That's why you can be a hero to your buyer by pointing some of this stuff out and maybe doing some uh, second-level sort of due diligence to uncover if there's existing issues or past issues with it. One of the questions that you didn't ask was, uh, in the state of Washington, there's Form 17, where the seller is supposed to do a disclosure that doesn't exist in Oregon, unless it's residential. There's a residential disclosure, but commercially there's no disclosure. So what always surprises me is when people cross out the Form 17 language, it just blows me away. I go, really? Mm -hmm. Seller says, I'm not going to give you a Form 17. And you go, well, if you're not going to give me Form 17, I'm not interested in buying the property. I mean, that's just like instant red flag to me. So it should be... You have more questions? Yeah. So what we can offer is a really customized services based on what you feel the risk is on a, on a given property. And I'll just give you a quick example. So Vancouver uh, Public Schools is a customer of ours, Evergreen Public Schools. And they, they really wanted the ability to bring us in and us identify very specific unofficial information to help them uncover potential problems on, on their properties. And um, without triggering a whole process, but to uncover areas to include in their capital projects and so forth, like water intrusion issues and things of that sort, right? Um, and that's been very, very helpful to them. So we, there are certain things that we're um, inspecting for and testing for, and a whole bunch of things we're not. And so that we can really create an inspection based on what the needs are for that owner uh, or potential risks on that property. Um, the other thing that we, we do a lot of is post-construction cleaning, and here's where we can be a help on that. We talked about all of the flaws that can occur in uh, new construction or large renovations, uh, particularly I mentioned venting, uh, proper venting. Um, we do a lot of post-construction cleaning on large projects. In fact, we're getting ready. We just got the contract for the LOCA project over in Southeast, a uh, big mixed-use uh, residential, 240,000 square feet. Um, the benefit to bringing us in as a partner uh, on that is that we can actually work in a, a post-construction inspection into that to identify are there some other issues here before we close this property and, and either ownership changes hands or um, uh, you know the, the property is delivered to the owners. Um, that, that's a way we can really be an asset to the, the purchaser and broker. Yeah, thank you for saying that. We're actually doing a construction defect, uh, a bunch of projects on a large commercial structure uh, right now. It's, it's, it's surprisingly common. Construction defect is a cottage industry in Portland. There are a number of companies, that's almost all they do. And so identifying some of those issues while your contractor is still engaged and under contract and legally required, oh boy, right? Um, uh, potentially a huge money saver, yeah. Thank you. So... We've been around for 40 years. We do a lot of property management of apartments and commercial buildings, a wide range of sizes from 50, you know, 40 units to uh, 
to 120, and we also actually do a whole uh, significant amount of houses as well. We sort of break into houses, and we skip a box, and we go to the bigger stuff. And on our commercial buildings, um, we <clears throat> we're anywhere from 10 to 100,000 feet, sort of in that middle middle zone, uh, where you don't need to have a full time on site. We do pretty much everything from our office centrally. Um, and from a due diligence standpoint, we have helped a lot of clients. Um, we just are working on a transaction in Vancouver where we we threw in the, the a basic due diligence process, not a thorough due diligence process, because they didn't want to pay for it, right? So we said, here's our limitations. This is what we're doing for you. We're just making sure the building's standing. We're not going to do mold. We're not going to do mildew. We're not going to crawl space. We're not going to do dry rot. Just, and that's all they did. And so uh, we said, we'll throw that in as part of the property management uh, program. And so they're going to sign with us and we'll manage that project starting in October or November when it closes. So, but we can do that for our clients and we're happy to do that. But we're, we're not going to put a lot of um, you know, clearly we have experienced people on our team, but you really need experts. I mean, we, we, we want to delegate to experts. From a liability standpoint, I think we all agree. Is that it? Are we set? Any other questions? Thank you so much for paying attention and being here this afternoon. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.